Good morning. Welcome back to my regularly scheduled stream, starting a few minutes late because OBS is messing with me this morning. Hopefully you can see me and you can see what I do on a screen. That would be ideal. Yeah, you can. Okay. So I'll take it. I'll take it. Um, today we are going to continue along the path that we have been forging the last several sessions, which is that I still want to integrate uh, OAuth 2 in general, but also GitHub in particular, into IkiWiki, the web content management system. So I'm going to try to do that. Pull up my dashboard here. Um, <clears throat> where we left off, maybe you just noticed it. Uh, I was able to click preferences and have some kind of authentication happen that then delivered me to a URL afterward. And there's just a lot of details to work out. Uh, in the last session with Ryan Latta, we um, got the communication with GitHub's OAuth working. So to recap how that goes, um, I registered this application, githubauth.local. Magic wand is gonna work today. Yeah. So I registered githubauth.local with GitHub as an OAuth application. And as a result, I have a client ID and a client secret Obviously, in a real production application, you would not want to be showing a secret uh, on a public display, but this is just one for development, and I'm okay with that. Uh, and then we started working through the IkiWiki plugin API, uh, which is what these subroutines are about, using internally this Perl module, NetAuth2 Profile Web Server, which is an OAuth2 um, interface for programmers that is designed to run in the context of a web server, which is what we are. Uh, an important method is auth, and that's exactly where we use, we make one of these new objects, and it has a name. I don't know the significance of the name, so I made one up. ID and secret go there. Um, the site is where you're going to go to do the authenticating and the authorized path is the first endpoint you hit to do an authorization request. And the second endpoint you hit there is where to get an access token. So it's sort of a, there's a little tennis match back and forth with the two servers, your web server and GitHub's authentication server. And this is how it ends up. And then at the end, you get redirected somewhere that you actually wanted to go, which I don't think we're using this right yet, possibly because we have our own redirect but I'm going to want to uh, use the IkiWiki API to find out where we came from when authentication became needed and go back there. IkiWiki has an API for that. Uh, so that's a good segue into what kinds of things are left to do. Most of them are like that. Most of them are that we need to um, use more of the IkiWiki API to replace hard-coded things or otherwise to integrate better. Because, for example, um, when I click Edit or Preferences and I haven't authenticated yet, it shouldn't just go hit GitHub without asking anybody. That might be like a special case in a site that doesn't want any other kind of authentication, but in general, IkiWiki can offer uh, configurably multiple types of authentication. We want GitHub to be able to be one, and I suppose we want GitHub to be able to be the only also, but uh, first we need to get it to be one of the list. We should see a list when we authenticate for the first time, and that's not what we're seeing here. Um, and there's some other IkiWiki API calls we need to make, like for instance, um, we're going to want, we are setting name, but we want to set it to something uh, reflective of the GitHub user's name. So there's going to be some GitHub API calls here too. Um, once we have an access token, that means we can continue to speak to GitHub, which we will want to, 
to get the user's the things that I hope exist in the GitHub API are the user's name. Uh, the reason for that is that in a NikiWiki site, when you do an edit or a comment or anything else attributable, um, the name is is something that it uses to show who changed what. And because it's a wiki, that's it's really important to have that. Um, and then we also want to, for authorization purposes, having authenticated, meaning having validated that who we claim to be GitHub agrees, uh, and that that's a real person, or I don't know, that's not the way to say it. It's um, that, but yeah, basically that the claimed identity is is verified by the party that we asked to verify it. That is who it claims to be. That doesn't mean that that person can edit this wiki. Uh, and that's authorization. So uh, GitHub also will have calls that let us, I, I hope, I assume, given a user, determine whether they're a member of a project or an organization. Because what I want to have behaviorally is anybody who's the member of a particular GitHub project, if they would have access to be pushing code to the repo or otherwise making changes in the repo, then those should be the same people who are allowed to edit this self-hosted site. That's what I'm after. So authorization wise, I wanna be able to get a group membership or actually ideally to not have to enumerate the group memberships to just say yes or no, this person, this group. Uh, that would be ideal. So we have things like that coming up. Um, yeah, and in general, <laughs> Lots of work to do to get this plugin uh, upstreamable. Right now, it's like a proof of concept that OAuth 2 can happen. Something else I started thinking about is, um, as you can see here, don't put GitHub specific crap in here. I, I think what I'm going to need, and I don't really know, and that's why we have to prove it out by working this through and seeing what it feels like. Um, there are many OAuth 2 providers out there in this day and age. GitHub is one of them that we'd want to interoperate with, but there are also others. And uh, I want to structure the IkiWiki code that interacts with these services in whatever the best factored way proves to be. And I have guesses, uh, like I'm guessing that what we're going to end up with is an OAuth 2 plugin um, that probably nothing, like probably admins will not enable it directly. This is my guess. Uh, and then it will be used as a kind of a runtime dependency by uh, site specific plugins like a GitHub with its particular API calls for getting name and uh, group membership and whatever, or I don't know who else is an OAuth 2 provider, but something like that. And so the admin isn't gonna say, I wanna generically turn on OAuth 2. I'm not sure that's something that works that way. I don't know, that's my guess. I think the admin's gonna wanna say, add a login with GitHub button, make it so, you know, and here's the configurables I care about for GitHub and do whatever you got to do website to make that work. And so I'm guessing the factoring is going to be that the OAuth 2 stuff goes in here. Admins don't load it directly and they will load plugins like a GitHub or another site that they want to add to the list. Uh, and that also would mean then that um, to add a new OAuth 2 based site to your login options requires writing a little plugin. So we either want, if, if this is the right approach, which is all to be determined, then we want to either make it uh, extremely easy to write with very few details required, just the bare minimum, or maybe make it so that that's not how it has to be done. I don't know. I'm just trying to feel my way around here. In our last session, in our last session with Ryan, we got authentication working, which I was not expecting to happen so quickly. So let's move on to what we can see to clean up. Um, we did this. We figured out the callback URL. I had this problem 
to begin with that I, I don't know what they're going to tack on. So I don't know what, like, should I give a partial query string? Should I name a parameter that I want it to be named and they're going to put the value or what? And it seems like they parse the callback URL and then determine the format that they should add to it. So at any rate, that's been figured out. That's been figured out. Uh, if I need to do this again, that's where. Let's just drop that at the bottom. Uh, right, and this is a question mark. Let's start putting to-do items at the bottom I like that better. Get it out of the way. So here's a question. Register here. Actually, admin needs to register their wiki, wiki site here. And when I document this eventually, I'll need to provide, you know, what what should you give as the callback URL? And that depends on your wiki, wiki configuration, for example. Uh, this was a question about the query string that we construct. Because, uh, yeah, because the way that I gave the callback URL to GitHub when I registered was that there would be a parameter called OAuth2. Um, and I think this is not risky, my understanding, uh, that every IkiWiki plugin that wants to have its way with a query string makes up a unique enough key that other plugins won't use that it will use. And I think that's all that that means. But before we ship this, I should convince myself that that's true. So I'm gonna leave it there as a question. It's an easy enough thing to, to change. Uh, if I really had to, I could even randomize it and store some state in IkiWiki's little Berkeley database. Um, I don't think any of that's gonna be needed. I just wanna make sure I answer the question before we're done. Uh, right, so we're going to need a button that redirects to there. Uh, what happens now, for some reason, it goes straight there. And that's kind of antisocial because I do have other authentication plugins enabled. So I don't want it to choose GitHub Auth for me. I want to choose. So let's see what we can do about that one. Let's organize our to-do here. All that. Edit. Yes. Don't just jump up to, to get a bot. Go to Wiki Wiki's usual list of choices. Okay, I don't need this URL anymore because we are able to do that. We are able to do that. I'm gonna keep this text though. Ted explains the sequence. That's from Jitter Ted. Just conceptually, I want to have that in case I need to think about it freshly later, because I don't totally understand how this works. I roughly understand how this works. Uh, yes, don't put GitHub specific crap in here. Let's put this a different way. Uh, once otherwise well factored, figure out where GitHub details need to go. You know what? I think I can collapse this into one to-do item. Add a second OAuth2 provider, and that will force it. Uh, another thing we need to do is uh, document how to enable GitHub Auth. 
side elements. So that's part of it. Then you put all that, etc. What else is coming up here? Yes. So there's some to do sort of sprinkled through the code. Let's get those organized. You know what? You know, I'm tired of this. I want to start doing the first thing. That's good enough for me. So when somebody hits edit or prefs on a site with this enabled, we want to go to IkiWiki's usual login page. For that, I believe we can do so by borrowing from the OpenID plugin, which is conceptually somewhat similar. So here's what the OpenID plugin does when it is loaded. And I think we want to do similar things. So we have a get set up and an off. We don't have a form builder set up. We don't have an, any of the other load plugin or register login plugin stuff. I don't know exactly what it does. I want to see what form builder setup means in the IkiWiki API. Each time a form is set up, this hook is called uh, in case it needs to modify the form. It does not validate or display, but it modifies the form. So what is OpenID doing about that? takes a hash. It's got the form parameters. It's got the form, the session, and the CGI objects. OK, in the event that this is a preferences screen, we do something. And that's it. OK. And what is it doing? I don't know. Looks like it's getting the name. And using that as the okay, so maybe we need something like that. That's for later though, that's not affecting the login screen per se. I think what we need to do is why do we need email offloaded? What's that about? Using an email address as a login. Why does OpenID need that? Maybe to be able to send an email? I don't know. That seems weird. I think all I need right now is probably these. So I'm going to take that. And then where it says OpenID, I'm going to call it 2. and then figure out what those callbacks are about. Open ID setup. Login selector. Auth plugins can use the login selector helper plugin to let the user select which authentication method to use. I want that. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so IkiWiki has this pattern in some plugins because there are so many dependencies, and many of them optional depending on which plugins you load, uh, that it tries to load the dependencies at runtime in many cases and just disable the feature if they're not present instead of failing to do its job entirely. So I'm just going to follow this pattern until proven otherwise. Take this whole. Yeah, these are the ones that we're that we're borrowing right now. They're right under get setup in that example. So again, let's go for OAuth2. Oh, 
I'll come back and actually think about this in a second. I'm just changing the names of the tokens. All right. So set up. If we can load the module, I'm going to need that method too. Here, that's just right there. That's not the one. Uh, in our case, it will be this fella. Thought that'd be more than one word, but it is one word. OAuth2. All right. And so that satisfies that. Uh, what do we mean by this? If the query string has an open id identifier defined then we will stick that in the template i don't know what that does to what so i'm going to say for now Just that. Next. Oh, okay. Okay. It looks like that's something that's going to be used very shortly. So I'm going to keep it. Oh, I'll do identifier. Fine, fine, fine. Let's just try doing it the exact same. Uh, action, action, verify. This is returning true if action is defined and it's verify and URL is defined and it's non-zero. That's check input. Otherwise it will return false. And then OAuth to auth. Sure. Uh, so then let's validate. Really cargo culting here. Validate. Let's come back for this. Let's see if This gets me to the regular login screen. No. It did not. We're trying to do this, but loading did not seem to have happened despite this. Yeah, I think what we need to do is remove our session cookie and try reauthenticating. So let's do that. Storage cookies. No. 
think I need to do this. Why are we trying to make that already? What I'm expecting to happen here is that we get the icky wiki login screen, uh, which looks like, hopefully I'm not logged in here. It looks kind of like this. And you can say this kind of authentication or this kind of authentication or this kind of authentication. Or get up. For some reason it's trying to to load it's trying to do this new which is right here on line 66 when we call off why are we calling off not clear to me Especially if we don't have any cookies. Why are we going that way? Okay. We're commenting out the auth hook helped. Here there's a cookie that I could delete. And if we put it back. I don't get that. Okay, leave that for now. Now why are we not in this list? Is it because I needed to do the form builder stuff too? Quite possibly. Okay, and then we'll have a method that we call form builder set up, and it's going to be copied and pasted also. And as I gradually understand what I'm doing, I will improve the situation. So IkiWiki has an API function called OpenID user. Hmm, I might have to add one for OAuth user or somehow reuse that or generalize that. Uh, So that's for the preferences screen. So then I'm not sure how this would help other than maybe indicating that I'm interested in the form. Into your open ID, where does that come? template there's an underlay in login selector hmm. so maybe I need to be working on this template for the login selector plugin in order for us to be able to be in the list what about password Is that super weird 
Okay. So then maybe I need to be duplicating some open ID things again here. I don't don't feel really good about any of this. So here's the form. It will submit to the IkiWiki CGI URL. This is the login selector form. Select login method, part of a legend. Hidden types, login choice. If there's an open ID, if there's an email. All right. Then I think what I'm doing is duplicating these things. I think so. Don't love it. where we see that H3. So this, this isn't exactly what we want to be doing. I don't think we want like a button, right? That goes to GitHub, but First, I want to get something to happen. And I think it's not going to be enough to do that, but maybe I'm wrong. Let's see. Yeah, I think another thing we're going to need to say is in the IkiWiki sites configuration to use these templates. Yeah. So Lipter is like so. Templer. Ay, ay, ay. Think right there. Okay, maybe, but also I think we needed to do something in here. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Ryan stuff. Hey, stuff happened. All right, so we're using the right template. We got a cause, we got an effect. Um, we got not exactly what we're looking for, but something's happening. Okay, all right. <clears throat> that got screwed up. So how does this work? Selector in it. Login selector.js. Where's that? Uh, 
underlays, login selector. Input ID, login methods, other sign ID. Woof. Okay. So we're going in here too. Right? <laughs> Maybe. Open ID is really sprinkled in here. This is going to require actual thought, which I didn't think I was ready to be doing. Hmm. Sad. Uh, I'm just trying to smash stuff together. I figured it would be easy enough to do, but what I'm finding is that however OpenID support was added required a lot of integration points. Uh, and I haven't tried to understand them. I, um, I'm hesitant to continue smashing my way around in this fashion because it seems like I need to understand and like in some cases uh, I want to do exactly the same a second time as open ID is doing and sometimes maybe I could get by with the same like reusing what's there because conceptually they're similar Um, and this just seems kind of effortful for how awake and prepared I am to be doing this. Uh, how much open ID is in that file? All right, so what is this, if it's still there? Simple JavaScript open ID selector. Hmm. Take a look at the fact if you'd like to integrate open ID selector with a bunch of those things. Anyway, this is this is probably not where it lives today. This looks like some version of it. not clear what the real fork should be. So let's take a look at the fact. Doesn't seem that helpful. Boy, oh boy. 
This turned into something larger than I was ready for. So we've used this. So the promise of this tool from whenever it was made is that you could even just pick a logo that over here. Been doing something kind of like this. Store the ID and secret. Generate a user access token. We can do that. We just can't stop first and see if GitHub is the way to do that. Check your progress. Make requests on behalf of the user. So for example, get information about the user with the user REST API endpoint. There's the whole code example. Securely store your client secret. I didn't see where we got that button. You should see a link with the text login to get up. Okay. Boy. So this was a spike, uh, and the result of the spike is, whoa, let's reconsider. Um, do I really want this end state for icky wiki, whatever it is? Yes, I really do. Uh, when, o when OpenID was a going concern, I don't know a lot, a lot of sites that offer it anymore, but when it was cool, it was great. Um, and when it interoperated with sites the way that OAuth 2 seems like it might, it was really handy. Uh, and I would like IkiWiki generically to have the new version of that. Um, do I specifically need GitHub? Yes. Otherwise, I would have to somehow duplicate for every person who contributes to the project, my particular project, not Qmail. Uh, just duplicate everything about who's allowed to do what across GitHub and self-hosting. And we're not trying to be self-hosting, we just need a more capable documentation site. I guess the duplication wouldn't be the worst kind, but it's in my spare time and I don't want to be wasting my spare time or managing it. The membership of the group doesn't change that often, but that's actually an argument against this being okay because it's unlikely that I'll remember that I need to do things in two places if I do it that rarely. Um, could I do it the easy way now and do the hard way later? Maybe. Uh, maybe I could just set up IkiWiki with like specific permissions somehow. Yeah, you know what would be an easy enough way is um, ignoring web editing because IkiWiki can be... Uh, you can edit an IkiWiki just by git push. It has a post update hook. <laughs> Uh, we're working with people who know Git, so that might be plausible. Uh, 
the way to edit is to git push, and then I can take their public SSH keys and put them on our self-hosting git where the Akiwiki site is, and that would work well enough. Just have to distribute SSH keys. And then we could be getting started with a self-hosted documentation site. So maybe that is the way forward. If my collaborators on the open source project, not Qmail, are comfortable with either not editing the wiki, because I think most of the time, most of them don't, uh, or having to do a git push to edit the wiki and then see if it see if it works by rendering it on the server, or setting up their own AkiWiki instance if they're really motivated and then rendering it locally before they push. If they're okay with that, at least for some interim period, then we could migrate much sooner. We could migrate as soon as I can stand up a site and get the content that's already in the wiki. So you know what? I'm coming around. I was trying to do this as a prerequisite so that there would be no friction for my open source contributors. Um, but maybe there's sufficiently low friction anyway to just move it and add web editing later. Maybe that would be fine. I'll have to run that through with uh, with at least one of them, just to make sure I'm not choosing obnoxiously on other people's behalf. But the sooner we have it self-hosted, even without this, the sooner we can incorporate a really important piece of historical documentation, which is written in a different format, not Markdown, that will be comparatively easy to integrate into IkiWiki. And in fact, I think I want to validate that assumption right now. Uh, the documentation I'm talking about integrating is a copy of this. So this is called Life with Qmail. As you can see, it was last updated probably around the time NetQmail was last updated. Not not Qmail, NetQmail, the predecessor. And uh, Dave has given me a copy of his local source repository with all the revisions to this document. This document is some of the very best online documentation that we've ever had for Qmail. And I want to be updating it, but the way that it's hosted right now, he's not hosting it, someone else is hosting it, and they're not really open to having it be updated, but Dave was open to having me fork for our purposes. And my vision for that is that it's a great sort of tutorial on how to get things going that was written in the era before good packaging of Qmail was possible. That's one of the things that not Qmail has made a dent in already, uh, is that we want things to be packageable and we've made it so. Uh, and it's also written in an era where everybody had to be applying their own patches to be able to get Qmail to do what they needed. And uh, that's still true in the not Qmail era, but it is getting gradually less true over time. And so we want to be able, like this is this is a long document because historically you needed to learn a lot of things and do a lot of things manually. And so you need to know what they all are. We're trying to make those, trying to lower the cognitive load of getting a, a not QMail system going. And so over time, I would expect the, the list of things that have to be documented in this way would become smaller, uh, like certain patches, when they are integrated or their equivalents are integrated into not Qmail, that's a historical footnote. You can always go look at the original life with Qmail and see what used to be the case. But over time, our documentation could generally be getting shorter. 
except for things like you know new features that need some of their own documentation but in general this should be getting shorter and we need a way to manage it so my little validation step here is what was the format that he provided and what can we do with that so let me do pull up off screen where i have some notes can't even remember where I have this right now. I know the format of the repo he sent me was RCS, which is the predecessor, the non-networked mandatory locking predecessor to CVS. So that gives you sort of a, a time and place. Uh, LWQ, not QMail thing. SDF. So the input format that he wrote this documentation in is called SDF. I'm going to drop it on our screen here in a moment. Blarg. Yes, it's me. Person. Oh, yeah. Simple document format. High quality outputs, variety of formats from a single source. Uh, HTML. So what I need, the hypothesis that I'm <clears throat> trying to, I guess the assumption I'm trying to validate here, that <laughs> if, I, if I put GitHub authentication for IkiWiki on hold, so that I can self-host the existing Markdown wiki and quickly import life with Qmail into it. That assumption depends on a couple of things. One, that there's existing code to render uh, this input format that's in Perl, ideally. I guess if it was any program I could spawn it, that would be good enough, but ideally Perl, because IkiWiki is Perl, um, that would be great. Uh, and another assumption is that uh, because IkiWiki has this assumption, for any uh, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between input files and output files. So if it's one Markdown input file, you get one HTML output file. If it's one textile input file, you get one HTML output file. If it's a PDF input file, you get an exactly the same PDF output file. But you don't ever have one input file that makes multiple output files. So one thing I need to be sure of, and I think it's true because this is probably like all the options, PDF, PostScript, but this is one long document. And so I think it's the case that when we generate HTML, we're not generating like a whole tree of navigable files. We're generating one. And as long as that's true, or at least that's an available option in the thing that does the rendering, then this should be pretty quick. Uh, another thing I'd want to validate are what are the dependencies of this thing to do the rendering? Is there anything tricky in there? Uh, but my experience with uh, input formats for IkiWiki, which I've added before, are it can be very fast. It can be 15 minutes if we know how to, if there's a Perl module, we can easily load it. Uh, there's not much to configure to get the output that we want. It can be super, super quick. Uh, one thing we might need to do that wouldn't be quite as quick is I'm assuming that it's going to generate a complete HTML document all by itself and not sort of leave you a blank header and a blank footer. If it can, that would be chef's kiss. If it can't, we'll have to strip ourselves so that IkiWiki can do 
the same thing for that page that it does for every other generated HTML page on a site. Uh, but that's relatively minor. That's, that's not a big deal. Uh, requirements to generate PostScript, which we won't be doing to generate PDF. You need Acrobat. This here. This is, this is a nice old input format. So let's look at the code very briefly. This looks like the little command line tool, SDF. Converts SDF to other document formats. So ideally, I would not use the command line tool. Maybe this is the command line tool. Ideally, I would use Oof, how is this supposed to work? This looks like some pretty old style Perl code. So I would have to figure out how to call it. It doesn't look like a use statement followed by uh, a new object and then an object method call. Um, it can't be too hard, but yeah. So that's, I'm gonna go based on the conclusion from this that probably, yeah, almost certainly it's very easy Certainly it's possible to generate one HTML file for one input. Do I have my, yeah, that's where I have it. Okay. So where did I put? So I already went through some trouble to convert the RCS repo to a Git. That way I could even keep the, the history as I bring it into our self-hosted site. So somewhere. That might not be how to find it. Yeah, I don't know where I have the files for this. Uh, I have them somewhere. Might have to dig it out of email. The only other way this could be not great is if there's more than one input file. And that's how you get the one output file. In any case, those are all relatively tractable things to deal with. So I th I'm going to try to change direction here. I'll check with my with one of my Nakumail fellow developers. But I think that I should just go for self-hosting using Git to edit the wiki. And then later, you know, as we get web editing working, then we can have that too. And that way we can be self-hosting our documentation much sooner. So I'm probably gonna go that route. And maybe next time I stream, I will be showing you how to work on input format in IkiWiki. Let me show you a real quick one right now, and then I'll sign off. I think I did one for man doc. Yeah. I think it's all in here. So this is in progress, but it's pretty basic. There isn't a Perl binding for Mandoc, so this one I do call out to a program. This is a way to, this is not upstreamed yet, at some point I want to finish this too, and use it on my own site, but it's a way to take a Unix manual page and turn it into a web page. So for example, like if you go to man.netbsd.org, this is not using IkiWiki. 
but a lot of other things on netbsd.org do. So like packagesource.org is a Nikki Wiki site. Um, wiki.netbsd.org is a Nikki Wiki site. We have others. Um, this could easily be a Nikki Wiki site. And then maybe it sort of lowered the, the marginal cost of administration maintenance. If given a collection of NetBSD manual pages, they could be rendered uh, statically to HTML, including sort of cross-reference hyperlinks uh, and whatever else needs to happen to make a well-rendered manual page into HTML. So Mandoc is a tool that can do a lot of this if it knows what to do. And Perl is a language that can certainly do the rest. So this was my idea that it would be really cool, both for my own usage to publish man pages for my software on the site with the software, uh, and maybe someday to you know replace this use case and have it be slightly easier to live with. So the way this works for an input format plugin, you have a check config, you have a get setup, you have a sanitize, and I think that's all I was doing so far. So check config, uh, make sure that you've defined the things that have to be defined in your configuration. Uh, get setup tells you which things are configurable. And then sanitize uh, is like a post process step, I think. And then the real bulk of it is this HTML eyes which turns the input, whatever it is, into HTML. And the way that works with Mandoc is that you pipe the output of Mandoc with this argument into an array of lines, and then join that into a string. Now you got an HTMLized version of that content. Um, and then I try to post-process a little bit, like you can see here. When there's a reference in one man page to another man page, we want that to be a link, because the other man page will be there, if we're lucky. So this is, this is a, like an input format plugin, and it was relatively quick to do. Uh, another one that I've done, I think, is uh, what was it called? Uh, I think I live coded one as part of this talk. That's right. So let's find out which one it was. Uh, at the Pittsburgh Perl workshop in 2014, uh, somebody announced a new input format for text. And I thought, I'm giving a talk tomorrow about IkiWiki. Let me demonstrate making an input format plugin for it. Swim, that's what it was called. Okay. Pearl Weekly Swim. A plain text markup language that converts to many formats, including HTML. So this was a super easy one to do. I don't know if I still even kept it around. I guess so. I did keep it around. Okay, so it has one hook, which is that it converts things to HTML. And here's how it works. It loads the modules that Swim says to load to convert to HTML in particular. And then it makes a new grammar, it makes a new receiver and it puts the content in, and you get it back as HTML. It can be this easy. I did this in, in minutes on stage, programming out loud in front of a crowd. Um, so in principle, input format plugin is easier than authentication plugin. In practice, 
in our case, probably still true. And I think that's what I'll pick up with next time. So let's sign off for today with the conclusion that probably I'm going to defer GitHub support until I can have more pair programmers that know these things that can help me. Uh, and probably I'll pick up with uh, getting self-hosted first and adding this input format plugin as soon as I possibly can first. So more icky wiki next time. And thanks for watching the stream, watching me struggle through this and think about it out loud. See you next time.